Coming up on Arirang News. For the first time in years, the two leaders of South Korea and Japan are meeting this week. President Yoon's two-day visit to Japan this Thursday for talks with Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida is seen as an important milestone in restoring strained bilateral ties from past wounds. North Korea fires at least two ballistic missiles toward the East Sea, their second test in just two days. This in response to the ongoing Freedom Shield exercise, a large-scale South Korea-U.S. joint field drill that's taking place for the first time in five years. Shockwaves from the collapse of the 16th largest bank in the U.S., the Silicon Valley Bank, hammer global bank stocks as contagion fears grow. South Korea's stock market also tumbles today, with the country's benchmark Cosby falling by more than 2.5 percent. Good evening. It's 9 p.m. here in South Korea. Thank you for joining us on Arirang News. We begin with the upcoming first visit by a South Korean president to Japan in four years. That's due to take place this week. Unveiling details of President Yoon's Tokyo trip, Seoul's top office hopes it'll serve as a turning point in restoring Seoul Tokyo ties as he sits down with Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. Our presidential office correspondent Oh Soo-young has our top story. South Korea and Japan are set to normalize their bilateral relations with a breakthrough summit in Tokyo, resuming top-level shuttle diplomacy. That's according to National Security Advisor Kim Song an speaking to reporters on Tuesday. Ahead of President Yoon Seo-gyo's working visit to Japan, Kim said the South Korean leader and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida will discuss all areas of bilateral ties to break the vicious cycle of spiraling relations between the neighbors, which fell to a critical low four years ago. At the core of their talks will be resolving the trade dispute triggered in 2019 when Japan slapped controls on exports of key chip materials to Seoul. This followed a Korean court ordering Japanese firms to compensate the Koreans they subjected to forced labor before and during World War II. Stabilizing military intel sharing will also be discussed, as the practice became rocky under the previous Moon and Abe administrations. There will be an opportunity to discuss ways to resolve policy barriers and deepen economic cooperation between the two countries. Through this summit and dinner event, the two leaders affirm their will to enhance bilateral relations as they build mutual trust on a personal level. Also on the agenda is how to implement Ho's plan to compensate the Korean victims of forced labor through private funding without demanding reparations from Japanese firms. As the first top-level exchange between the two countries since 2011, Yoon's trip represents the restoration of four bilateral exchanges. His schedule will begin with a luncheon with Korean nationals, followed by a summit and state dinner with Kishida on Thursday afternoon. On Friday morning, Yoon will greet South Korean-Japan friendship groups, then sit down for lunch with business leaders from both countries. Signifying their focus on the future, the president will give a lecture to Korean and Japanese students at Keio University. Yoon will be joined on the trip by First Lady Kim Goni. All eyes are now on whether the Yoon Kishida meeting will result in a joint statement that turns their determination to improve bilateral ties into practical action. Oh Soo-young, Arirang News. This morning, North Korea fired at least two ballistic missiles towards the East Sea, their second test in just two days. This as Pyongyang continues its backlash against the ongoing joint military exercises by Seoul and Washington. And today, the U.S. flew military reconnaissance planes around the Korean peninsula. Our defense correspondent Kim Yeon-sun with the details. North Korea fires more missiles just two days after its previous provocation. South Korea's military from 7.41 a.m. to 7.51 a.m. Tuesday local time detected two short-range ballistic missiles fired off to the east. They were fired from Hwanginamdo province on the peninsula's west coast and flew for 620 kilometers before landing in the East Sea. 
That's a distance that puts the south of the Korean Peninsula well within range. Seoul and Washington's intelligence authorities are currently analyzing the details of the launch. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said in a statement that North Korea's consecutive missile launches are serious acts of provocation and a clear violation of UN Security Council resolutions. It is demanding an immediate stop to these actions. It also said that it has strengthened monitoring and vigilance for any possible extra launches and that it's working closely with its U.S. ally to maintain full readiness. In fact, state-of-the-art American spy planes patrolled over the Korean Peninsula this morning around the time of North Korea's missile firing. The RC-135S Cobra Ball was deployed over the East Sea and the RC-135U combat scent was dispatched to the west. These aircraft most likely gauged the projectile's trajectory and the point of impact. This is North Korea's fifth ballistic missile firing this year. It also closely follows North Korea's two submarine-launched missiles on Sunday, of which the North claims to be strategic cruise missiles, which hints that these weapons could be nuclear-capable. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said to reporters on Monday that the U.S. is analyzing the submarine launch test to gauge the North's full weapons power. Pyongyang has been stepping up its weapons tests and fiery tone as a clear protest against this whole Washington military exercises. The Freedom Shield, the largest joint drill between the Allies in five years, kicked off Monday. It lasts for 11 days total and runs through some realistic war scenarios on computer-based simulations and extensive field training that factors in the up-to-date progress of North Korea's weapons capabilities. To the training, the U.S. is also expected to deploy its strategic assets, some of its most formidable weapons that could include nuclear-powered aircraft. Kim Hyun-sung, Arirang News. In the meantime, top nuclear envoys of South Korea and the U.S. sent a strong message against North Korea for its repeated missile tests this week. Our Choi Min-jung has more on how the international community is responding. South Korea and the United States' top nuclear envoys have strongly condemned Tuesday's launches by North Korea of two short-range ballistic missiles. Seoul's foreign ministry said that South Korea's Kim Gun held a phone meeting later on Tuesday with his U.S. counterpart Sung Kim to discuss Pyongyang's provocations. The officials said that the launches are a clear violation of a number of U.N. Security Council resolutions and raise tensions in the region. They stress that the regime should realize that it has nothing to gain through such provocations and that there will be a price to pay. Following the launches, the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command stated that it is closely consulting with allies and partners. It added that it has assessed that this event does not pose an immediate threat to U.S. personnel or territory or to its allies. The agency did, however, note that the actions highlight the destabilizing impact of Pyongyang's weapons program. It also reassured that Washington's commitment to South Korea and Japan's defense remains ironclad. Meanwhile, Japan confirmed that the missiles landed outside its exclusive economic zone, which extends 370 kilometers from its coasts. Japan's chief cabinet secretary said Tuesday that Tokyo will continue to maintain close cooperation with Seoul and Washington as it prepares for further provocations by North Korea. Choi min Jung, Arirang News. Now, turning over to the Silicon Valley bank crisis. U.S. President Joe Biden vows for stiffer bank regulations and the safety of the country's banking system, while the Federal Reserve is launching an investigation. Our Shin Ayong has the latest. U.S. President Joe Biden has vowed stricter bank regulations to tame concerns stemming from a string of bank failures. His remarks came on Monday local time after the nation's regulators imposed emergency measures following the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. Biden said Americans can be confident that the banking system is safe and that their deposits will be there when they need them. That includes small businesses across the country that bank there and need to make payroll, pay their bills and stay open for business. No losses will be, and I'm on, this is an important point, no losses will be borne by the taxpayers. He added that the managers of these banks will be fired and that investors would lose money, saying they knowingly took a risk. 
The same day, the U.S. Federal Reserve announced that it launched an investigation to review the supervision and regulation of SVB. In the statement, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell said that the fallout of SVB demands a thorough, transparent and swift review. Vice Chair of the Fed's supervision Michael Barr is leading the review and the results will be announced in May 1st. Citing an anonymous source, Bloomberg reported that the U.S. regulators are reviewing whether SVB and Signature Bank conducted the required planning and stress testing following the Fed's rate hike, which started last year. Amid the growing questions about the causes, according to the Wall Street Journal, the auditor of the two banks, KPMG, is highly likely to go under investigation as SVB collapsed two weeks after KPMG gave the bank a clean bill of health, while the failure of Signature Bank came 11 days after the KPMG signed off on its audit. The worst-case scenario would be a series of bank runs where customers panic and try to withdraw their money out at once. But so far, this has not happened due to the emergency measures put in place by Washington. First Republic Bank, which saw a decline in its stock price of more than 60 percent on Monday, is reportedly operating as usual. The founder of the bank said that it had received additional liquidity from the Fed and J.P. Morgan Chase and is not seeing massive outflows. Shin Ha-young, Arirang News. South Korea's stock market slumps today as more investors pull out following the collapse of the SVB and Signature Bank. Our Lee Dae-yeon reports. South Korea's stock market tumbled on Tuesday as investors assessed the Silicon Valley Bank fallout. The country's benchmark Kospi fell by more than 2.5 percent from the previous day, ending at 2,348.97. The tech-heavy co stock also fell 3.9 percent to close at 758. Analysts say this is due to shrinking investor sentiment as concerns rise that Signature Bank has become the next casualty. Also, investors are wary of the U.S. Consumer Price Index that's set to come out later on Tuesday. Should the CPI outcome exceed the market forecast, the U.S. Fed will be more expected to increase interest rates despite the anxiety in the current financial market. Heavy sell-offs by foreign and institutional investors were also one of the reasons for the market tumble. On the foreign exchange front, the Korean won strengthened by 9.31 against the U.S. dollar, closing the day at 1,311.11 as investors tend to avoid relatively higher risks in the global financial market. Meanwhile, South Korea will continue to closely monitor the fallout from the Silicon Valley bank collapse. During a meeting with financial authorities earlier on Tuesday, Finance Minister Chu kyung said the impact on the domestic market appears to be limited. He said asset liability structures adopted by Korea's financial institutes are different from SVB's and domestic banks and investment firms have minimal exposure to SVB. However, he added the government will still brace for any possibility as volatility and uncertainty remains. Lee Dae-hyun, Arirang News. Following the collapse of tech-heavy lender Silicon Valley Bank earlier this week, global financial stocks have taken a tumble. According to Bloomberg on Tuesday, the total market value of companies on the MSCI World Financials Index and the MSCI Emerging Markets Index has plunged about 465 billion U.S. dollars in two days. Asian financial stocks also dropped on Tuesday, with Japan's Mitsubishi UFJ's financial group shares falling by about 8.6 percent. Meanwhile, Europe's benchmark stocks Europe's 600 banks index, which includes 42 banks in the EU and the UK, was down by 5.7 percent on Monday, while the global investment bank and financial services firm Credit Suisse's shares plunged by more than 15 percent to an all-time low. South Korea's trade balance last month managed to record a surplus, but tech outbound shipments fell for the eighth straight month. This with a sluggish global economy and a slump in the semiconductors industry. Our Moon Aryeon has the details. Data released by the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy on Tuesday show that the country's ICT exports fell by 32 percent on-year in February to some 12.8 billion U.S. dollars. 
However, the country's trade imports in February also fell, dropping 3.6 percent to stand at $11 billion, leaving a trade surplus of $1.8 billion. This is the eighth consecutive month in which tech exports for the country have shown an on-year fall, although the decline eased slightly compared to the more than 33 percent fall in January. The slowing economy and sluggish demand for semiconductors contributed to this slump in exports. Shipments of semiconductors fell on-year by 41.5 percent, with memory chips such as DRAM affected the most heavily, declining by over 50 percent compared to the same month last year. The price drop for DRAM chips was a key factor, with prices steadily falling to under $2 for an 8 gigabyte chip, down from around $3 in the first half of last year. Outbound shipments of displays and computers also showed a downturn, falling by 42.2% and 58.6% respectively on-year. Display exports have been showing an on-year decline since June last year, owing to the fall in LCD prices and slowing demand for OLED screens. Exports of mobile phone products fell 5.5% on-year, but performance varied drastically by region with the release of new mobile phone models, meaning mobile phone exports to China were up and exports to the U.S. increased by more than 73 percent. However, China's slow economic growth meant total exports to China fell, despite the easing of COVID-19 restrictions. South Korea's exports to Vietnam, the European Union and Japan also fell on year, with a notable drop in the semiconductor sector. This report comes amid concerns that Korea's semiconductor exports may be affected by efforts from Washington to curb chip sales to China. Moon Hye-ryeon, Arirang News. South Korea is working hard to support the younger generations through policies that cater to their needs. The nation's political circle is also giving more opportunities for the youth to participate. Our National Assembly correspondent Yi Shi-hu tells us more. In Korean, the term for young people or youth is Cheongnyeon, or translated literally, one's bright and green years. But data show that reality for today's youth isn't always so bright. Survey results released March 7 show that more than one in three young people have experienced burnout in the last 12 months. Recent studies also show that more than one in five young people have debts amounting to more than three times their annual income. To support these youths facing various challenges, South Korea has come up with new policies. In late February, South Korea's National Assembly passed what's called the Framework Act on Youth. The act aims to encourage young people to participate in politics as well as proposing policies with young people in mind. The act requires all government committees to include a certain number of young people, whereas previously this was required only for committees dealing with youth policies. It also calls for easier access to the list of policies relevant to young people and for regional youth centers to make available information on those policies. At the National Assembly, many lawmakers are also working hard to provide opportunities for the young generation to participate in politics. One of these lawmakers is Kim sung ju Beginning this month, he's running a program where young people get to be his honorary aides. The young aides are giving suggestions for new laws. We will actively reflect in our lawmaking process these suggestions from young people who help us see the problems in our society and how the future should be. Mr. Kim won who served as the head of the Young Generation Committee of Yeonsugu District in Incheon City, is also a current leader of a political group called Young People Together. He said that more voices are needed from the young generation to change our political structure, which caters more to the elder generation. The structure right now is made for the older generations who actively participate in politics. The more we participate in politics, the more voices from the young generation can be heard. With about a year left to the general election, policies for the young must continue to be developed not only for the results of the election, but for the future of our country. Yi Shi-hu, Arirang News. In sports, 
Son Heung-min of Tottenham Hotspur won the goal of the season at the 2023 London Football Awards. Son was unveiled as the winner on Monday at a special ceremony held at the Roundhouse in London. The forward earned the, earned the earner for the second of his three goals against Leicester City in September last year, a match that Tottenham won 6-2. Sun also won the LFA goal of the season in the 2019-20 season. Independently, independently judged by figures from the Football Administration and the football media, the London Football Awards celebrate the very best of football in the area over the course of a season. One of the country's most popular spring festivals is underway amid the broader lifting of pandemic restrictions, and our Kim jong sil had the chance to partake in its sights and sounds. White, pink, and red mehua flowers decorate the mountains. Visitors head to the Gwangyang Mehua Village in Gwangyang City, Jeollanam-do Province, every March to see the plum blossoms. The festival, a must-visit for flower lovers, came back bigger than ever after the pandemic. This weekend alone, some 170,000 people visited this village. For many people in South Korea, these mehwa flowers or plum blossoms represent spring. And with this festival being held for the first time in four years, tens of thousands of people from all over the place have come here to enjoy the spring. I think this festival is beautiful. Like I've never seen so many mewa flowers because we don't really have many in the United States. So being here and seeing so many and having a beautiful day, it's just been like a really great experience so far. Yeah, we always wanted to like uh, come to this countryside um, because we've been like around the city area. Um, but it's just so beautiful, like the river and the weather's being really nice today. And the flowers so. smell amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I was a bit exhausted from all the traffic, but when I actually got here and saw the flowers, they were much more magnificent than what I imagined. This is the first family trip in a while, so it's been such a great day. I also had a great day. The mehua flowers haven't just brought smiles to the visitors. Faces of local vendors also lit up with orders pouring in for the first time in four years. Visitors can enjoy plum-flavored candy and ice cream and also buy other products to take back home, like mehua flower seedlings and gochujang made with plums. The city officials say the entire city is basically a festival site as anywhere people go, there will be mehua flowers in one way or another. The festival runs until Sunday, March 19th, when the flowers begin to fall. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News, Gwangyang. Tomorrow will be another cloudy day with milder than average temperatures. Fairly warm conditions are in store for Seoul with highs reaching 13 degrees Celsius. The south of the country will be much warmer though as a high pressure system covering the region is bringing a surge of warmer air. Places like Uisong in Gyeongsangbukdo province will see maximum temperatures of 23 degrees. And for those across Gyeonggi-do and Gangwon-do provinces do expect brief showers. And some violent winds are on the forecast nationwide. Winds will be gusting as fast as 15 meters per second. For regions with higher elevations, such as mountainous areas of Kagwanda province, much stronger winds are expected. With dry spells persisting across the nation, fire danger remains high. Please be extra careful with anything that can start a fire. Tomorrow's hall will be starting off at 7 degrees and Busan at 12 degrees. The nation will see increasing clouds for the daytime. Seoul will get up to 13 degrees, Gwangju 21, Daegu and Gyeongju will be reaching 22 degrees. And on Friday, southern parts of the country will see showers. That's all for now and here are the weather conditions around the world.
That's all for tonight's newscast. Thank you for watching. We'll be back with the most up-to-date news tomorrow. Good night.